um, is a taxi driver and a skydiver, um, and also a stand-up comic. And uh, you know, he's uh, I believe he's a college dropout as well. Am I right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, dropout from college. Um, and uh, you know, kind of you know, a checkered past. Checkered past. Yeah, it's an interesting history. Um, but you take all that, you roll it together, and uh, somehow that produced one of the most innovative minds in modern rocket science. Um, he is the brain and engineer behind, and engineer. Well, you know, I think it takes a little bit of science. It's like, here's my opinion. If you're running, uh, if you're running Excel all day, you're a scientist. If you're running SolidWorks all day, you're an engineer. So I think you're more of a scientist. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, so without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Doug Jones, Chief Scientist at Export Aerospace. So let's go to the, uh, the Xcore folder. And, yep. Uh, quantity has quality. Right, gotcha. And you want me to play the whole presentation? Yeah, just bring it up and uh, we'll go to full screen. Yep, all right. Uh, so, uh, our, our claim to fame at XCore is that we're always trying to do more than one thing at a time. <laughs> Mike, yeah. let's use the microphone. Speaking of the mic, Doug. Yeah, it is pretty noisy here. So uh, let me put my uh, my game back on as well. Yeah, that's pretty good. 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 Yeah, that's pretty and also technology development. We do a little bit of uh, congressional lobbying. We wrote the first draft of the uh, Space Act and Space Act amendments of uh, 2004. So uh, for a small company in the middle of nowhere in Mojave, we end up punching a lot above our weight class. And this first image we start off with is that engine, rocket engine is actually running. That's a 7,500 pound thrust box methane engine that we've worked on under a NASA contract with uh, ATK serving as our um, cutout, shall we say, that uh, they ran interference for us with NASA. I'm not sure I can make this any louder. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, I'll pretty much just hold it against my chin. And uh, because I'm getting a lot of gain on this, so I wasn't sure how loud I was getting there. Okay, so uh, this is a LOX methane engine. That was one of the projects we were working on in 2007. The other one was the uh, X-Racer for the Rocket Racing League. And uh, as it turns out, the two customers uh, ended up staggering when they came up with the money for their projects so that we managed to uh, pace ourselves rather nicely on that. And in this shot, you can see that the, uh, the engine is running. You can just barely see some shock diamonds here because uh, methane burns so clearly that it doesn't get the bright, luminous flame that you see in so many other rocket engines. And this was a tremendously useful program for us. We learned a lot from it, and that led to one of our larger customers, more recently, United Launch Alliance, who uh, is paying us right now to do uh, technology development, leading towards creating a new replacement for the RL-10 rocket engine, which has been in use since the 1960s. And this new engine will be a 20,000 pound thrust class uh, LOX hydrogen engine, which would be the replacement propulsion for the Delta and Atlas launch vehicles. So if we manage to pull this off, we'll be a small company in Mojave that uh, all the major civil and uh, military and uh, reconnaissance satellites for the United States will be going up on engines provided by our small launch team. And they were all the engines that started out on my computer. That's kind of mind-boggling even for me. I've been working in this, in this industry for 14 years and it still just amazes me that uh, I have such a large footprint there. So, our next slide. Uh, X-Core usually has more than one thing going at a time, and that has been one of the more useful things for us, because we have typically a small engine test stand and a large engine test stand doing experiments at the same time. So on the left, we had our 2P1 engine. The 2 was the thrust class, P was the propellant. which started off as being propane, but later evolved to ethane. And 1 was the sequential engine design. So that was our first rocket engine at X-Core. And we finally retired that thing about five or six years ago after it had been in use for like seven years and accumulated almost 2,000 engine runs and several hours of runtime. And dozens of different people had operated it. And we used it as a training thing for our new young engineers so that they would operate this simple rocket engine test stand so that they would get the experience before we moved them on to the bigger and tougher projects. 
and that same small test stand in the year 2000 uh, also worked on our fourth engine, which was a nitrous oxide and alcohol engine. And we built a larger test stand and operated, built two engines and operated them on that. This was our first liquid oxygen uh, oxidizer engine. And then the, uh, the second engine of that type, our third engine overall, ended up being the main propulsion for the Easy Rocket, our rocket airplane, which was our first kind of calling card to show that we could do something more of than just propulsion. So uh, having these two projects in parallel and then these two projects in parallel allowed us to do technology development on one of them and go, ooh, that trick works. And we applied it to the other engine we were developing at the same time. So the cross-pollination managed to get a lot more evolution done in a shorter period of time. Yes. And this shows all of the, uh, the history of all the rocket engines we've ever developed and built at XCOR. And I uh, had to go to a logarithmic scale because otherwise it would just disappear. It would be difficult to see. So we did uh, the 2P1 engine, soldiered on until uh, like mid-2007. And then the, uh, the uh, engines for the Easy Rocket did a, lot of, did a lot of burn time. So these were pretty much our operational engines. So it was the T-Cart, the Easy Rocket, and the X-Racer all accumulated a whole lot of runtime on it because we were either doing lots and lots of demonstrations. We would take the T-Cart to an event like this and actually run it in front of the crowd so that people would be just a few feet away while we're operating. And then the Easy Rocket and the X-Racer both did a lot of flights. And on the X-Racer, I personally was in the right seat for six of those flights. So uh, there was an, a question on the uh, Quora website a few, few weeks ago about, you know, what's the most impressive rocket launch you've ever seen? Or what's the most impressive rocket launch ever? And I said, the most impressive launch, bar none, is the one that you are aboard. And nothing else you know, comes close to touching that. So that. So in 2002, we did uh, more flights of the Easy Rocket. We took it to the Oshkosh Air Show, the biggest air show in the world, and flew it in front of something like a quarter of a million people. And as we were towing it down the flight line to the end of the runway to prepare for a flight, Dan and I are sitting on the tailgate of the, the plane and, and just, you know, kind of grinning ear to ear. Dan said, you know, in the last five minutes, you know, 50,000 people took your, took your photo. And I realized, well, I wish you told me that earlier. I would have sucked my gut in. <laughs> we also developed pumps. This was our first um, piston pump that we uh, did. Not on a contract. We, were, we went for a SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research contract. And everyone says that you can't develop hardware on one of those SBIR contracts. So what we did was we built the hardware on spec out of our own pocket, and then the, we proposed for the grant for the SBIR that we do the testing of this pump on their contract. And that was, of course, a slam dunk. We did more flights of the Easy Rocket. And here's um, interesting Mike Melville in his Long Easy being the chase pilot for Dick Rutan in our uh, Easy Rocket. And later on, Mike Melville did a flight of the Easy Rocket itself. So before he flew Spaceship One for scale composites, Mike's first experience of flying a rocket-powered airplane was in the Easy Rocket with x -Bar. So that tells you what a kind of a small town Mojave is, that you have all these personal connections and end up doing, doing a favor for the guys down the, down the flight line. And then the next year, we continued on. We started developing our first kerosene engine which uh, that photo was actually taken, taken in daylight. It just looks like it's a, a nighttime shot because the kerosene burns so bright. We did a couple more generations of uh, pist free piston pumps, and this was all under a DARPA contract. And there's a saying that things are DARPA hard. And DARPA likes to do things that are particularly difficult that might be game-changing things. It would be disruptive technology that would uh, advance the state of the art. Trouble is, free piston machines are a nightmare in operation. They're a pain in the neck because there's nothing to synchronize when things are going back and forth. So instead of having a nice sinusoidal motion like a typical piston machine that has a crankshaft on it, no, it has a it has a triangular motion. It's going bing, 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 and it's bouncing off of each end of the machine. And the, the vibration and noise on the thing are just horrible. So the next year, we'll go to the next slide. 
we uh, decided to go ahead and put a crankshaft on it. This machine down here has a crankshaft and a flywheel and one piston machine. And it's just the, uh, the pistons running sideways here, and these are the valves that control the gas going in and out of it. And we demonstrated with that machine that we could have a self-starting, continuously running. We've got hours of runtime on this, pumping both water and kerosene. And uh, also did more flights of the Easy Rocket, which was at the uh, XPRIZE Cup. And this was a, kind of a step toward the uh, X Racer that we later did for another customer. We generated, we developed new materials. This uh, composite here on the right is what we call non-burnite. It's a fluoropolymer composite which cannot catch fire. So we can use it for a liquid oxygen tank, which is an integral structure of the, of the spacecraft and is a lot safer than aluminum. You can't put stuff, this stuff on fire, which is important because I'm going to be sitting about three feet in front of one of these tanks. So uh, you know, I really want it to be as safe as possible. And it also makes it higher performance. And uh, we were also developing our first methane engine, which later led on to other technology opportunities later on. So the next year we got that big methane engine contract from NASA, which was really quite a shocker for us because we had the experience with the small 50 pound thrust LOX methane engine. And we had proposed for both the reaction control thrusters that NASA was looking for for their crew exploration vehicle, which was to be their follow-on to the space shuttle, and they were also asking for proposals for main propulsion for that vehicle, which would be like a 7,500 pound thrust engine, which was far larger than anything we had ever done before at XCOR. And to our utter shock and amazement, we did not get the contract for the engine for which we already had some experience at that scale with that propulsion. We had built a locked methane engine of our own and proposed some rather minor modifications to it for NASA's application. We didn't win that contract. No, we won the contract for the main engine. And you know, this is kind of like a dog chasing a car down the road and then going, oh my god, I caught it. And at the same time, we got the contract with the rocket racing team to do an 1,800 pound thrust rocket engine for an airplane for rocket racing where they would be doing pylon racing in front of the crowd. So we had these two huge contracts that we won at the same time. Now fortunately, the rocket racing folks had their own financial crisis at that point, and they couldn't come up with the money to pay us to move forward on that contract. So we said, okay, no problem. You know, we'll put your contract here, your project on hold, and then we worked our asses off on, on the methane market. So it was rather fortunate that the way the customers worked out, we had these two large contracts, but they didn't 100% overlap. And to do this engine, we had to develop a new test stand. And to do this engine, we had to develop a new pump. So, you know, this ended up being just like every other year previously in the company, that it was a very busy year. It, uh, it, uh, there's no way that uh, I can do a retirement in place at XCOR. If ever I tried to do that, I would just totally fry. So this is, uh, oops, we got a little shot, let us go back. So in 2007, we ended up getting the methane engine all the way from the prototype engine that you saw on the previous slide to the fully regeneratively cooled version. We got the engine for the X-Racer operating pump fed on what we call the firewall test stand here where it had the entire power plant that was going to actually go on the aircraft was tested on a stationary piece of equipment. And we also got it flying. That's uh, actually the first flight of the X-Racer with my great big wide eyes in the right seat. And we also did the next generation of our small engines. We, all, we always try to have a, a, it's not that we particularly wanted to do this, but it has turned out that almost all the time we've had a small engine and a large engine in development at the same time. And we ended up learning a lot from both programs. So it turned out this was a, a nitrous oxide and uh, ethane engine, which was kind of an outgrowth of our first engine that we had done. But after 2007, one day when we were out doing testing of this engine, there was a terrible explosion at the test site next door and three people were killed. And nitrous oxide was involved in that explosion. And after that, we decided to stop using nitrous oxide as a propellant. And we moved on to other propellant combinations, which required the, de the development of yet another rocket engine design. <laughs> So this kept us busy in um, 2008. We did additional flights with the X-Racer. We did uh, a return to Oshkosh, where again, we were the, uh, you know, the most big 
out the outrageous off the wall aircraft at the air show. We did a demonstration of, of racing type turnaround on a rocket vehicle. Um, the U.S. Air Force says, you know, responsive space is when you can do a launch, you know, sometime in the next three months instead of the next two years. Uh, we managed to do a turnaround in eight and a half minutes, which from chocks in to chocks out. We did uh, seven flights in one day. At the end of the program, we managed to fly uh, seven more people. Each flight had a different person on the right seat, so that uh, everyone in X-Corps, including uh, all of our interns, and uh, I think, let's see, of all the people in this photo, um, this 12-year-old girl and her mother decided to didn't fly. And one guy whose wife uh, really didn't want him flying because he was also a volunteer policeman. And she was just decide just tired of him, you know, taking that many risks. So he decided not to fly. But other than that, everyone in that photo flew on that aircraft. So I don't think there's any other rocket propulsion team in history that has ever had that much participation in the actual operations of a rocket vehicle. That, that is very definitely the first. And we try to qualify anything. We don't try to say, we're the first commercial rocket airplane because some people have also done stuff. So we try to make sure that we don't make any claims that we can't back up. But certainly we have the greatest participation ratio of any rocket propulsion company. And next, we continued on. We uh, took that uh, second generation ethane engine and turned it into a uh, different one with a different uh, liquid fuel instead of a ga gaseous fuel and using oxygen instead of nitrous oxide. We worked on wind tunnel models for the uh, Lynx, which is our late uh, refined design for an aerospace plane. Actually took it out to uh, Dayton, Ohio for uh, aerodynamic testing. Mark was actually a, a big part of that. And we started testing the higher pressure, higher performance kerosene engine for the Lynx vehicle. So we had two engines in development, aerodynamic testing, we had materials processing going, and of course all the usual political folder all that we have to go through with sending people to Washington to deal with Congress and so on. So we uh, took our old one-cylinder pump and ended up pumping liquid hydrogen with it. We actually took that to another facility and pumped liquid hydrogen. We uh, continued development of the engine. We had a uh, gas-cooled nozzle on here, which is something that uh, I don't think anyone else has ever done. This is actually an aluminum nozzle in a high heat flux situation, which you would expect aluminum to melt like that. But uh, from a dynamic cycle, it looks like it will close, and uh, we'll be doing, we did supersonic wind tunnel testing for the Lynx, and we've got a uh, subcontractor, orbital outfitters, developing pressure seats for us. So, you know, we're, we're basically doing everything that NASA would be doing but with 1,000 as many people. And then next. So we did even more pumps. We've got uh, the, the new LOX pump for the Lynx. We've got the latest reaction control thruster for the Lynx, additional testing for the engine. We've got two new hydrogen engines that we're designing and in development, but we can't show a picture of them just yet because the customer is not aware. You know, we don't have, we have to get approval for something. And uh, let's see, the next slide. I'm kind of galloping through this because I've also got some videos I want to show. We've gone through seven generations of rocket engine igniters, and we kind of joke that uh, one of our hazing rituals for new college interns is to have them do a statistical reliability series on an igniter. So we basically give them a test setup and a data acquisition system and tell them, okay, run this thing a thousand times. And that usually takes them all day. Uh, our, uh, our safety engineers said that, well, you know, if you want to, if we had no failures in that thousand ignition test when we get the, uh, everything tweaked up to the way it's supposed to be. And our safety engineer was saying that, uh, you know, if you want to show 95% um, confidence in the results, you have to assume that the next three tests will be failures. So with a thousand tests, we could only predict 99.7% reliability. So Randall said that, well, if we want three nines reliability, we have to go to 3,000 tests. And I looked at him and said, but that would take all day. Because when, back on the methane project with NASA, one of the NASA engineers told me about an igniter project that they had going. And they had done 12 tests of their high-tech igniter. And they were very proud of that. 
in the month before the first test of the, of the big methane engine, I personally did 2,500 igniter tests in one month. So there's a quantity, has a quality, all its own. Once you've got a lot more tests, you have a little bit more confidence in the system as you're doing. Unless you can go back just a bit, I think there was one more other thing. And uh, so this shows the various igniters. These are all little bitty rocket engines. You can see shock diamonds there. It's putting out about a pound of thrust. And it's just running on uh, gaseous oxygen, gaseous methane. We've we put the various ingredients into it and just run the heck out of it. It ends up with a spark plug that's about an inch long in real life. It has a little four inch thread on it. It's like a scale model spark plug. This allows us to make everything a lot smaller and more compact. The NASA people were really astonished that we had such small rocket engine igniters because they typically think that you need to have about one or two percent of the flow of the main chamber of the engine is required for the igniter. So for a 7,500 pound thrust engine, they assumed that you would need an igniter that would be the equivalent of a 75 pound thrust rocket engine. And that's a hell of a big igniter. This is like one pound of thrust, so we were tiny, tiny in comparison. And they were utterly astonished when they found out that our igniters work reliably, igniting a flow that's more than a thousand times the flow of the igniter itself. But when you come right down to it, when you have like a, uh, a jet engine in an aircraft, they don't even have a spark torch igniter, they just have a spark. And so they light off, you know, an engine to power a 747 with just a spark plug. So it really shouldn't require such a heroic igniter that NASA has assumed in its baseline requirements. So next. And we've also gotten some patents. This is for the uh, combust combustion chamber technology we came up with. It turns out this was the cheap way to make a rocket engine. It also, kind of as an unintended side effect, makes for a very long life rocket engine. It doesn't get the uh, thermal fatigue issues. As you see here, the, the different cross hatching this is the combustion chamber here, the one end of the cross hatch, and then you have a jacket around it. The fuel comes in here, it flows through the walls, and then into the injector bay. And ordinarily, in previous technology, you would have, instead of a separate jacket, you would have nickel plating on the outside to define those coolant passages. The trouble is that nickel is very strong, and it stays cold because the fuel's flowing by. And the copper on the inside gets hot because there's a flame right against it, even though the fuel is cooling. So that copper expands, and it doesn't have anywhere to go because the nickel is right there. So the copper expands, gets a lot of strain in it, yields a little bit, the metal actually uh, changes shape. And then when you shut the engine down and it cools off, it tries to shrink. But the, copper, but the nickel outside, again, keeps it from being able to shrink. So you end up having thermal fatigue it kind of like bending a paper clip back and forth until it breaks. And it turns out in a typical rocket engine, you can run it about 50 or 100 times before you start getting cracks in the walls and fuel actually leaks into the chamber. With these things, you can run them a thousand times and there's no sign of any, any aging to it because the, the copper yields on the first run but never does it again. So it's just entirely because we were trying to make it cheap and, and quick to the prototype, we were lucky enough to get long life out of it as well. Next. And, um, whoops, I guess we lost that slide. It was more about uh, some of the injector technology that we started off with, uh, with a NASA design from 1958 that came up with some improvements on that. Is that a large part of rocket engineering these days is an archeological science. That you have to go through what the, what the smart guys did literally a generation ago before I was even born. And they came up with some really good ideas that kind of fell by the wayside, didn't get played with a lot. And you read the old, the old research papers and so on and say, ooh, these guys had some really clever ideas that just didn't get applied going forward because there weren't enough programs doing a lot of different experiments. And so because we had to look for the things that were easiest to fabricate and had required the least amount of resources in terms of your machine shop, so we ended up having to go to the older references where it was easier to make some of this stuff and with the more advanced techniques that NASA later came up with. So next. So customers are lining up. This is Space Expedition Curacao, which is one of our resellers that uh, will be actually buying, wet leasing, a complete all-up vehicle from us 
and operating it. So that rather than selling retail tickets to everybody that wants to fly to space, we sell the vehicle to them and then they do the retail side. And uh, so customers are lining up and next. And uh, whoops, oops, oh. <laughs> ah, wait, I keep swiping it the wrong way. The, 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 there you go. And we're going. And uh, we have a nice simple flight profile for our uh, suborbital spacecraft. There's no motherships, there's no balloons, there's no uh, air breathing engines. We just light off the rocket engines on the runway, accelerate in about 13 seconds to about 230 miles an hour, lift off, put the gear up. Another 12 or 13 seconds, we're doing over 400 knots, and then you pull almost vertical. Uh, 60 seconds after engine start, you're passing through 30 something thousand feet and going supersonic. And uh, in about two and a half minutes on the Lynx Mark 1, you'll be uh, shutting the engines down at about Mach 2 point something and coasting over the top at 200,000 feet altitude. This is the uh, Mark 2 profile, which is a higher performance bird. We get all the, the, uh, the technologies that we still have in development it'll go into our second bird. We like to cross a chasm in two leaps if we possibly can, so we're doing a prototype which is slightly lower performance than our final version so that we can get the, the, the toughest part of the learning out of the way. And I think that's our last slide there. Yep. And uh, let's go to, the, to some of the videos and I can show you some of the cool stuff there. And this is kind of a, a free-form presentation I'm doing here. I don't have a... a used an old presentation, and it should be in the export folder. I'm going to find it real quick. Oh, um, hold on <laughs> it's, it's nice to have somebody else doing all this for me, so I'm not trying to walk through gum on my belly and pat my head at the same time. Which one do you want? Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, uh, 5K18 run at it. We'll just kind of take it from the top here. <coughs> this is a series of tests. Okay, we don't have audio coming up on this, but... Uh, okay, imagine it sounds really loud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we run the bunker for the engine run, it's just heartwarming. And you notice that it's a particularly clean burning thing. There's no, no smoke going down range. It's because we're using it. Unusual fuel. It's not the usual mm -hmm. RP1. It uh, has a lot of. For the chemists in the crowd, our, our propellant is a, a de-aromatized, desulfurized propellant, which has basically been multiply distilled and it's been hydrogenated so that it doesn't have any multiple bonds in carbon. Oh, so it's automatically playing other videos. Oh, this is one that uh, Clyde and I have been working on this project, which is some imaging using uh, blue light in order to be able to see through the rocket engine clip. And this is a uh, silent uh, high-speed video of the engine start. You see, we, we run the liquid oxygen first, we get a little flash there with the igniter kicking in, and then the, uh, the fuel valve opens, and you get the main chamber going. <laughs> and it climbs out of frame. <laughs> now, this was before we got more additional bracing on the uh, mobile test stand. We do all our test stands are on wheels so that we can work on them in the hangar, and then take them out to the test site to run them, and then haul everything back to the shop at the end of the day, it, it lets us get practice in running something that's a little bit like a rocket vehicle, that is not something chained down to a mountain in the desert. And it also uh, makes sure that all of the hardware doesn't have to live out in the wind and the weather with uh, all the, the sand blasting and the ultraviolet exposure. And also it means all the mechanics and engineers working on it can do so in the shade and the comfort of the paint. And all these things come together and make Doing stuff to town uh, you know, portably and you know, mobily with everything on wheels is just totally the way to go. We have one question. Where's that? Where's that? Do you have a video of either the links or the rocket laser taking off and climbing out? Um, we have a, uh, <coughs> let's see. Yeah, I think you have a links video there. I think I'm playing the Oshkosh first. Okay, yeah, we'll play that. This shows the actual uh, the uh, X racer getting prepared for flight. It has a really neat soundtrack that uh, we can play here. And uh, you guys work fast. Yeah, <laughs> we actually move that way in the hangar. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually because I have a bad back. Yeah. 
and we load the, uh, the liquid oxygen on, on the taxiway so that we aren't doing it indoors. And it, we always want to handle uh, liquid oxygen or liquid hydrogen outdoors rather than inside a hair. Uh, you don't want a chance for anything down. That's the uh, vapor cloud. Because we were in uh, Wisconsin in July, it was pretty good. Hey, and uh, the right seater on this flight, uh, Mark Street was over in the back of the crowd here. Mark actually got to fly on, I think, 17 flights of the X Racer. Or 11 flights, 11 flights. Okay, right, right. Between the two of us, we got 17. And uh, Mark was actually in the left seat for some of the tests, where he was actually doing the taxi tests, and I was in the right seat, uh, being the uh, management authority to keep him from trying to take off and fly with you anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I know the temptation was there. There you go. And here we go. It's, uh, that's a kickoff roll on the X-Racer in real time. And uh, the links will have about twice the acceleration, but it will also take off at about twice the speed, so it'll have about the same duration, but go a lot farther during the takeoff roll. And then it'll climb much more enthusiastic. Uh, links will be, uh, the, well, the peak climb rate, you know, before the engine, before the engine, engine burn shut down is about a kilometer per second. So It's, uh, this kind of speaks for itself. Here it comes around on a relay. And I think on this flight, on this pass, they do just a, uh, a roll during the climb out. You can see that it really is showing that it's a rocket plane. And these uh, vertical lines that you can see here in the video are actually because the chip panel is blooming where it's out of shot diamond and the kerosene and it would actually end up being useful as a kind of an accelerator to show us how stable the engine is going. All right, um, I'm going to see if I can find the Lynx video real quick, and then we're going to have to wrap. Okay. There you go. Lynx version 2. There we go. So this shows the uh, the basic flight profile of Lynx. We uh, roll it out of the hangar. We uh, load the propellants. You might want to zoom forward about uh, one quarter of the way through it there with the progress bar. There you go. There's the engine light. Acceleration down the runway. It takes off at about 200 knots, call it 230 miles an hour. Puts the gear up immediately after that, and this video kind of exaggerates the vertical climb. It actually accelerates for about 10 or 12 more seconds before that essentially vertical climb. But then the uh, the flight profile is kind of boring for the next two minutes. You're just boring a hole in the sky and going faster and faster. But it's it's as boring as any supersonic flight can be, where you're pulling almost three Gs actually as you're accelerating into the sky. And uh, that ultimately will actually be winding up a lot faster than that. If, uh, even at uh, 40,000 feet, it'll be winding around about once per second because of a thousand feet per second climb rate. Then you float over the top. We've got this uh, kind of greenhouse canopy, which will be um, in some ways a liability. It, uh, you've got several kilowatts of heat of sunlight coming in there, so we have to have a significant cooling system to keep from cooking the fruit. But here's this, uh, this is the view that you'll have from the right seat. With uh, nothing but black sky above and blue earth below. And uh, you're not going to float around in the cockpit because it's not big enough to do that without kicking the pilot in the head. And you keep everybody strapped down. And then you pull about uh, four G's eyeballs down and a few G's eyeballs out during the re-entry. Re is like a fighter plane. I think we level off about 60,000 feet is where we go subsonic. And then that's about 15 minutes of gliding down to the, to the runway. So that uh, the first five minutes are complete pandemonium, and then the next 15 are like, oh man, my heart's catching up with me. So you have a question. Is that, is that aerodynamic maneuvering to re or is that a reaction <coughs> control thrusters? Um, we use reaction control thrusters to uh, control it while it's out of the atmosphere. That's why we've been working on several generations of, of 40 and 50 pound thrust rocket engines. And uh, because once you're above 150,000 feet with, with zilch airspeed, there's nothing to control it with unless you have reaction controls. All right, uh, I think we think it's time. Yep. Okay. Galloping through.